my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Pramod Sharma. I first met Pramod a couple of years ago at a Kalu conference when he was sitting right in front of me. Um, he introduced himself to me as an actuary to the wealthy, or something, something along those lines. Um, a couple of years later at KLU 2011, last year, I saw that Promote was doing a breakout presentation on social media. Uh, my first thought was, how much can an actuary know about social media? The two didn't seem to combine. Uh, but I was quite surprised and enlightened, and, and I know you will be too. So please join me in welcoming Promote Sharma. You've probably gone to different presentations on social media, and what I've seen is that there's a general pattern where in 30 seconds or less, the presentation is saying, one, you must use social media, two, you can't figure out how to use it on your own, and three, hire me. That's been the gist of the presentations I've seen. Today will be different because in my case, I'm not going to say you have to use the tools. I would like to give you reasons why you might want to consider using them if you have not been using them. And I'll also show you that you do not need any help to use these tools. Now, you may decide that it would be easier if you did get help, but these are things that like, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people are using. I mean, they're, they're certainly usable as they are. And the other thing is you can't hire me because I don't sell any services related to this. If you want some insurance, you can talk to me, but I think you can take care of that on your own. And we will have a, a lengthy uh, period during which you'll be able to ask your questions. I would like this to be as useful for you as you can uh, have it. And so please do feel free to ask me questions when we get to that section. At any given time, there are prospects looking for you. And what they may be finding instead is someone else. This is an example of an email I received on LinkedIn where the person, total stranger, is saying, Promote, I'd like to talk to you about insurance. Now, this didn't actually lead to a sale, but there are people who are doing searches and they, they want someone, and if they're not able to find you, they will find someone else, and that could be to your detriment. One thing that we need to be cognizant of is compliance. Now, this is a very interesting aspect because Compliance is something that has a bigger impact on larger organizations, the ones that have the huge budgets that can afford billboards, magazine ads, etc. And so for them, if you're talking about banks, etc., compliance is a trap because there are extreme restrictions on what the advisors are able to do. And you need to look and see what you are entitled to do yourself. So if it's something that is trapping the organizations that have resources, then what you have is a key that gives you advantages over those large organizations. Because you'll see that companies have been trying to figure out how to use social media. And they have a challenge because it's really about connecting a person to a person. Large organizations want the connection to be from a person to an institution. And that doesn't work quite as well. So here is a way that you can connect to other people in ways that organizations with much larger resources are restricted from, from doing. Now, Advocates did a survey last January, and they asked advisors whether they use social media in their practices. And it turned out that nearly half the people did not, and they weren't even interested. And that's excellent, because that creates opportunities for the ones who don't have that mindset. And that's the way I look at it. And so I'm focusing not on convincing people who have no interest, there's really no point doing that, but showing the ones who are using the tools that maybe here's some other things that you could do, or if you're not quite decided, maybe you'll see that, oh, okay, here's something that might work for me. We'll be looking at three different things. We'll be looking at 1999, we'll be looking at today, and we'll be looking at ideas for your tomorrow. Let's start by reflecting. If you were not you, would you buy from you? When I look from my vantage point, I see a room filled with advisors. If there was a prospect that came into this room by mistake and they saying, hey, is there anyone here who can sell me some insurance, then how could they make a considered decision on who they should talk to? Because there would be lots of excellent choices for them, lots of experienced advisors, but 
they aren't going to buy from all of us. So how can they decide that, okay, this is the person that might be the one for me? And so this is a key question. Because what you'll find is that, by definition, most of us are close to average. That's what average means. And average used to be okay in the old mass market days, but it doesn't really cut it anymore. So if you had a leak in your basement, then do you want to pick someone who will fix that the cheapest way? Maybe not. Maybe you'd rather have it done right. If you have a medical issue, then do you just want to go to the nearest walk-in clinic and have them take care of it? Or do you want to find the best choice for you? Now, best is something that's subjective. It's something that is determined by the client or prospect themselves. And so it could be that if you're looking for a doctor, then the best doctor might be someone who is, say, within an hour of where you live. Maybe you have a preference for a male or a female. And maybe it's someone who is available to see you by next Friday. So you can't necessarily decide what best is, but you can pick your niche. And then within that niche, you can position yourself so that you are seen as the person in that particular area. And that means that you need to pick something small enough because we can't really dominate in a field that's, that's large. Now, this is the process to becoming best. And with social media, what you'll see, and just for the benefit of people taking notes, uh, I'll show you a link later on that has a copy of the slides. And I'm also recording this presentation, and if the quality turns out, I'll put it on YouTube. So you'll have access to these things. So this will be an example of using social media to explain social media. So for instance, when I spoke at Kalu last May, that's something I'd been wanting to do for years, and finally I got the chance. Uh, that I made a video of that also, and over 300 people have seen that, which is larger than the audience I had at the time. But if I hadn't done that, then I wouldn't have had those views. So I'll, I'd like to share what I'm doing with you today. <coughs> With social media, what you'll find is that there's a very small learning curve. So this might be 30 minutes or an hour. You'll, you can get on Twitter, whatever it happens to be. And within minutes, you're doing something. And then what happens is you get a little better at it and a little better at it. And then the results start to drop. Saying, well, OK, now I've been at this thing for a couple of weeks. And no one has called me. No one has bought anything. Uh, what am I doing? But what you'll find is that you need to keep going. And with social media, what happens is the benefits really come as you continue. Because what happens in most cases is that people stop. And with social media, if you're doing something, you're doing something, and you stop, you're going to slide down into the dip. And with social media, everyone knows you quit. You can't hide the fact that you're a failure. Because it's obvious to everyone, because they'll go to the blog and they'll see, oh, this person wrote four posts, but, oh, that was two years ago. They haven't done anything since. Or they started with this and they haven't continued with it. And that gives you an advantage also, because if you stick with it, and you'll see that it's not that difficult to do, then you'll keep getting further and further ahead just by that consistency. And there's a fascinating book called The Dip by Seth Godin, which goes into this more, uh, where he talks about there are certain times when you want to stick with things, and there are other times when you want to quit. And people tend to do things at the exact opposite times. So a good place to quit would be right at the beginning, where you say, well, gee, this thing has taken more than 15 minutes to learn. It's not really for me. But people generally get over the initial phase, and then they'll, they'll quit just when it's the worst point. Because they've already done the hard work, it's just a matter of continuing on with it. Let's look back to 1999. At that time, there's this person by the name of Tiger Woods. And this was, and this is where I have to look up my notes because I'm not a golfer. <laughs> uh, he started a winning streak. So he had eight wins. And that hadn't happened since 1974, which was before he was born. Uh, we were introduced to Britney Spears. Lance Armstrong won his first Tour de France. These were the top five movies of the year. And they seemed fresh at the time, but now maybe they're not as fresh as they were then. You can guess which one I like the best. 
we were worried about this thing called Y2K, where the water wouldn't flow, we wouldn't have electricity, we had to buy water and we had to buy all these batteries. I think we finally finished off the D cells uh, just before they were to, uh, to expire. So it was as if the world would be amazing the minute before midnight, everything would just be great, and then after midnight we'd be behind the Flintstones. But that was a big concern we had at the time, this Y2K thing. In 1999, there was a company called RIM that introduced something called the Blackberry. And it seemed like such a weird thing to create. Because I used to take the subway and I'd see these grown people hunched over and they're typing emails on a puny little screen with a tiny little keyboard and I'm thinking, what losers? Like, what kind of a person would have to be using email on the subway on the way home? Like, don't they have any lives? And now we have tools that we, like, we probably, most of us have, would have a smartphone now, and it's more likely to be one of the more modern ones where it can do a lot more things, mobile internet, etc. And at the time, uh, this thing didn't exist, the iPhone, that came out in 2007, and just in recent weeks, it has eclipsed the uh, RIM products in Canada in terms of sales. In the US, this thing that only came out about five years ago now outsells all other smartphones combined on both AT&T and Sprint. And this didn't even exist. So do you think tools like this might be changing the way that people expect us to deliver what we're doing? Do you think tools, tools like this might be changing the way that we do things? And there was also this company called Google. And in 1999, they moved out of the garage that they were in, into their first office, all eight employees. 1999, June or so, was the, year, was the time when they first got mentioned in the mainstream press. The New York Times mentioned them, and the article was not about search engines. Do you think this company has had an effect on how the world is today? And it's interesting when you look at their search engine now, because it's so similar to what they had then. They started off with a very simple, elegant design, and they have, in essence, continued with that. And since 1999, there are other things that have been developed that were not there at the time. 2003, this tool called LinkedIn started. Then we had this thing called Facebook. Normally, I talk about LinkedIn as a Facebook for business, but actually Facebook came after LinkedIn. Flickr, we can now start sharing photos. This thing called YouTube. Now, how silly was that? Like, why would anyone want to watch these grainy little videos of silly little things, like or cats or like people doing all sorts of odd things? It just seemed silly until Google paid billions to buy them, until it became the second most popular search engine in the world, as it is now behind Google itself. And then this thing called Twitter was developed and, oh, I'm talking to a group of people. I'm turning towards the screen. Like, why would anyone care about these, these minuscule little updates of things that, I'm, that are going on in my life? It just didn't really make any sense. It seemed, but maybe it did. And on the, the web page, I'll have a, a, li a link to this video, but this is a very interesting demonstration in about four or five minutes that shows how quickly these tools of social media have been adopted compared with other things that came in the past. We're at a stage now where your brand is no longer what you say it is, but it's really what people discover it is through Google. We don't have as much control. And the question that arises is that if you go to Google or someone else goes to Google and they type in your name, <coughs> What shows up? Anything? The right things? Those things can be very important to you. So what we'll do is we'll look at some things that you might want to consider doing for your tomorrow. And since my goal is to show you simple ways of doing things that you can do yourself if you want, though you can certainly get help, I've broken it down into having a web presence in three simple steps. So the first one is, and I think this makes a lot of sense for us as advisors, is to get on LinkedIn. Now, a LinkedIn profile is essentially your resume. But resumes are boring, so start with that as a core, but then make it interesting. 
there's a summary section that you can write at the beginning where it tells people about you and maybe encourages them to go on to the rest. Because you'll find that with the rest, the resume part, there'll be many other advisors who are close enough. When, when it comes to the summary and your life story or how, what makes you different, that'll, that'll be something that's, that's special. So a LinkedIn profile is free and it's really boring to set up. You, can probably, you probably have the content already. You just need to copy and paste it in. If you have younger family members or neighbors with teenagers, then you can probably get help from them, just buy them a pizza. Uh, but you can get set up on LinkedIn fairly easily. You'd want to have a web address. Ideally, you'd have one for yourself as a person. You'd have one for your business. If you don't have a website, then you can have your web address just point to your LinkedIn profile. Right. That could be a start, then you can develop things later as you wish. And then you also want a destination later. So this would be the third step. And so this could be a website, it could be a blog, it could be something else. But certainly, we can all have a LinkedIn profile. Right? There's nothing stopping us from that. That's all free. It's just a matter of taking some time. It's not like we're sitting in front of clients and prospects all day long. We do have downtime. If we take that downtime and we create things online that can be found, then we're basically planting a seed, a perennial, that will give us value indefinitely into the future. So those are three things that you can do. And then I'll explain in more detail how each of these things can be used at a relatively high level. And the idea is to give you the why rather than here are the mechanics of how to do these things. We're judged by the company we keep. And on LinkedIn, everyone that, connects, the, everyone that connects to you is a volunteer. And if the people who connect to you are of high caliber, then the implication is that you must be a good, solid person too. Now, you don't necessarily want to be connecting to your competitors because they're not likely to be buying your services. You want to connect to centers of influence, uh, potential clients, etc. Uh, so that's an easy thing to do, and this is some. This is my profile. Uh, I stopped saying the uh, actuary to the wealthy thing, and my new positioning I started recently is actuary, blogger, consumer advocate. So I just posted an update today saying that I'm speaking here at Advocates Golden Triangle. So that's just uh, showing what I was doing. It gives a sense of where I was working. There are some people who have given me recommendations. So that may give people a comfort level that I'm a decent sort of person, right? So they could explore further. Now, what I love as an actuary is analytics. So I can get statistics and information. I can look at trends. I can see what's working. And then I can do more of that. The things that aren't working, I can stop doing. And LinkedIn gives you lots of analytics. And I'm just talking about you having a free account. There are more things that you can do with the paid account. I just have the basic free one. But it'll show you how many people have looked at your profile in a 90-day period. So this is a measure of the quality of the content that you've written. Have you put in things there that are of interest to anyone? Are people searching for that? And so in, during this, in this time frame, that I showed up in 90 days about 904 times. That's interesting. But what's more interesting is how many of those people took the time to look at my profile. Because this is not advertising. This is not me going out and interrupting people who don't want to see me. This is people who are looking for something, and I have shown up on their radar, and then there are some people who have taken the time to look at me. And in this period, there were 158 people who actually looked at my profile. And this is all free. So as an actuary, I need to use lots of decimal places. But, <laughs> and I couldn't use as many as I wanted because the screen was only so big. But, so if you'll let me approximate, this is about 17.5% of the people uh, who found me who looked at my profile in this period. And then in a shorter period of time, uh, in a one day period, there were six people out of 19. And so that was about a third. Now these figures do vary a lot. And I was just looking at this yesterday. This figure, has, because LinkedIn is being used a lot more than at the time I did this, this would be over a year old. But as of yesterday, in 90 days, the 904 became 4,744. 
Now, this number did not increase in proportion, but there were about 316 people who looked at my profile during that period of time. So I'm getting a smaller number of people looking, but I'm getting a higher number of people in total, which is what I'm interested in. And these are things that are just free, right? And what's interesting is if someone looks at your profile, then in some situations you can see who that person is. And if there's someone you want to connect with, what I will often do is send them an invitation. And based on my experience, they always accept. Because they took the time to find me, and they're almost, flattered isn't the right word, but they're, they're happy that I took the time to look back at them. Because maybe they wanted to connect with me, but didn't think that I would connect with them. And so this is a way that you can grow your network with people who actually want to be connected to you. And they may be strangers, but then over a period of time, they could be very good centers of influence, maybe even clients. Websites. One of the things that you can do on LinkedIn, which is not recommended, but I have used it successfully, is you can send invitations to people you don't really know and ask them if they would like to connect to you. Now, there should be some reasons that you give when you're asking to do that, but it can be very strategic. And I did this in, a, in this case, and this person said that, you invited me to connect, but I didn't respond because I, I really didn't know who you were. Which is fair, because a uh, person didn't have to respond. Today I read your amazing website, and I'm an actuary, right? So if I'm not known for doing amazing things. And I really liked what you have to say. I connected a lot with your stories. I'm not a good storyteller. But because there are so few people doing any of this, in comparison, I stood out. So think of the things that you could do so that you can actually extend your network to total strangers or, or maybe referrals so someone knows someone, they say, hey, go to the website, and they get a sense of who you are. So then this is someone who already likes you without the hassle of them having to even met, have met you. And this person has turned out to be a good center of influence. Now, would you ever go and visit your clients wearing a t-shirt? If your email address provider is one of these companies, you're advertising them every time you send an email. And when you look at customer satisfaction surveys, then usually the cable companies and phone companies don't rank that high. And every time you're sending an email, you're advertising them and you're associating yourself with them. And that may not be a sign of someone who is successful or attentive to some of the little things. Because, uh, you may not know it, but it's very inexpensive to get your own email address these days. Google will do it for you. There is something called Google Apps, which will basically do lots of things for you in the background. If you don't have a domain name, then you can buy one for $10 US a year. This morning I bought one for something I'm, I'm starting. If you read my blog, marketingactuary.com, which I wrote yesterday, you'll see what that is. Uh, but I bought it in Canadian dollars, it was $12. Right? So, dollar a month. And there might be tax on that, so I don't know what that would be. But basically it's free. So now, all the email will come to that web address, right? So I own marketingactuary.com, for instance. So I am promote at marketingactuary.com. It's all Gmail in the background, but no one sees that. And if you want to create a website, you don't have one, with Google, you can build one for free. See, Google's business model is to get us to spend as much time as possible online. Because when we're online, then we're more likely to see their ads, which is the key way that they make money. So they can afford to give things like these away, where other companies would have to charge for, because they have a different business model. So we can easily create a professional presence by using uh, tools like this. Twitter. This is the one that I didn't understand for the longest time. Again, we're judged by the people that we're connected with. And in Twitter, the people who decide to follow you, again, are volunteers. You cannot make anyone follow you on Twitter. Someone has taken the time 
to go and look at your Twitter feed and say, I like this enough that I want to receive it on a regular basis. And if it turns out they don't want to receive it, then they just have to say no. You have no control over that. And so in my case, for whatever reason, because I'm not claiming to be doing anything brilliant, and you can look at my stuff, because it's all there free, I'm being followed by Toronto Star, Globe and Mail, Investment Executive TV, Advocus, Advisor.ca, uh, Deloitte Canada, some other ones. And that's just me writing stuff that's 140 characters. It's nothing brilliant. But for whatever reason, it's good enough that centers of influence are paying attention to it. And you can easily do that too. I mean, look at my stuff. It's, it's you just think, well, why are they doing it? But they are, and that's the key thing. And if they're not, then you can tweak and you can do things and change it so that they are. Blogs are another tool that you can use. In my case, for about five years, I was working at Industrial Alliance, and my job was to help advisors make more money. And I saw that the big issue that advisors had, or, or two of the issues, one was credibility, trust, etc. And what I thought would be very helpful there would be if advisors, instead of being proprietary about what they knew, because they, I'd see this situation so often that I've got this one page on annuities or this strategy or that, and if anyone else ever saw it, I'd have no sales. And then you'd look at it and you'd say, well, wow, it's not even well formatted. There's a typo. <laughs> Did you know that you can use colors? You can do lots of other things. But there was that feeling that, hey, I, I can't let anyone see it because there was this fear that competitors, like they're just lurking and they're just, going to, they're just waiting because they've got nothing else to do. They're just waiting to see what you're doing and they'll take that idea and then you'll have no business. When the real goal is to make your prospects aware of what you're doing. So I figured that blogging would be a very good way for advisors to help set themselves apart by showing their expertise and also their generosity. But I knew that if I told advisors, hey, why don't you blog, that's just empty talk. So I decided that I would start one myself so that I could show advisors how to do this. And so I actually started two. One was to help advisors market better, so that's marketingactuary.com, because uh, I was learning new ways of marketing and that was the mechanism I had for sharing them. And then I started another one called Riscario Insider, so advisors would have content that they could direct their clients to that was related to insurance and risk, etc. And I've kept at that, so I do about 100 posts a year. So in the beginning, it's nothing, right? Like you do a few posts and then no big deal. But as I was showing you with the dip, the benefits come when you continue with it. And so February this year, I marked my fifth anniversary, so that's 500 posts, about 250,000 words. Now it starts to get interesting. But again, it started with virtually nothing. It was just a matter of continuing with it and getting more and more value from uh, just continuing on in the process. And yeah, this is what I look like, I can't help it. But for people who don't like reading, maybe they like watching things. So you can put yourself on YouTube. This video I created two or three years ago, and people who know about video say it's horrible because the chair shouldn't be showing in the background. I didn't know anything about lighting, so I went to Canadian Tire and bought like 1,000 watt halogen lights and saying like, like, okay, you've got lots of light, but it's not supposed to be there. Like, you, like the wall is blue and you've done this. So I didn't know what I was doing, but at least I did it. And I've had hundreds of people who have watched this video. If I hadn't done it because I couldn't get it quite right, those people never would have seen me. And now I can do it better. And if you're someone who doesn't like writing, reading, or watching, then maybe you like listening. Maybe you're an auditory person. So what you can do then is have podcasts, and so that's something else that I experimented with. And now uh, I'm relatively lazy at my core, and what I do is when you write, you want the words to sound good to the ear. So I thought, since I read my blog aloud anyway, to make sure that it flows, why don't I just record that? And then it's a podcast. Nothing brilliant, but now I have another mechanism by which people can find me. Now, Twitter was the thing that I had the most trouble with. And so when I was 
being interviewed by the Toronto Star, which was almost exactly a year ago, uh, I finally realized that what Twitter could do, because I had these destinations, Twitter could be a mechanism to invite people to visit the content I had created. Because in 140 characters, you can't really do a lot. And because of that, I've had articles that are recommended reading in the Globe and Mail and other publications because I'm just making them aware that these things exist. And they have already said that they want to be informed of the things I'm doing. I have permission. A newsletter is something else that you can do. Now, so this, in this session, you may think, well, my goodness, he's telling us to do everything. No, I'm just showing you some of the things that you can do. And you may decide that this would work for me or that would work for me. But I just wanted to show you some of the possibilities. And again, this was something I started to show advisors how they could do it. And what we're doing here at the core is not interrupting people. We're using permission marketing. And so that means that we are sending anticipated personal and relevant messages to people who want the messages. So I cannot send anything to someone who doesn't want it. Everyone has raised their hand saying, yes, I would like to receive this. And if they don't like it anymore, then they can just stop. And there's nothing I can do about it. Particular, so a newsletter would look something like this. And so this is one that I had. These are just five of the links that I had. Again, I love to recycle things. These five articles were tweets that I had done in the previous month. So on average, I try to do one tweet per day. That means in the course of a month, I have 30, 40, 50. And then I look at five of those that I have already circulated, five that I think are relatively timeless, that are worth rereading, or, or maybe reading if people haven't seen it, and that's the newsletter. Five links, and then you have to write a few lines, because now you're not restricted by 140 characters, you've got more space. And now you've got another way of being in contact with people. Again, you get amazing analytics. With email you don't, but with a newsletter you do. So I can see what is being read. I know that if an article mentions Warren Buffett or Steve Jobs when he was alive, I know those ones tend to get read really well for whatever reason. Now, I can't put them in every particular issue, but I can see what things people are not reading. Because sometimes the one I think people should read, because I think it would be the most beneficial, people just aren't interested in. So maybe that's the way I wrote the headline. Maybe it's the way I described it. Or maybe it's something that benefits people. Say, I like having things on productivity. So maybe they just aren't interested in it. And so what I do is I avoid putting those in next time and putting in more of the things that people like. And I know what those things are because I'm getting statistics. I know who is reading. I know their name, the time they're reading it. I know how many people have unsubscribed. And so when I look at how many emails get sent out, I know how many people have opened it, how many people have clipped through. Now, when you look at this, you could say, well, OK, you sent out 335 emails, and only 43% of the people even bothered to open it. So more than half the people don't like what you've sent enough to even take a look, right? And that's true. But I'm not interested in those people. I'm interested in the ones who actually do something. So the way I look at it is that there were 145 people who were interested enough to take a look. And of those, about 16% took the time to click on one of the links that I had in there. And then you refine this, and so the the figures are actually much better now, but that's how they were at the time. Because it's a fine-tuning process, and you've got actual data that you can use to figure out what you're doing. In my case, I don't restrict who can subscribe, but basically I'm interested in people in Ontario, because that's the only place I am. And I'm, it's essentially the 80-20 rule. I am reaching the people that I'm after, and a lot of them are in the GTA, which is where I'm really focusing. Now, a question that gets asked is, does social media work? And I think it does, but you have to reach your own conclusions. If you typed in Warren Buffett life insurance, would you believe that I show up before Warren Buffett? When I am referring to his message that he wrote in his Berkshire Hathaway newsletter in 2004? No, I mean, you have to type those words. 
But I, I was checking this again last night, and so now it turns out this is the number one hit, but I'm number two. And I have people, because what I was doing here, I was helping an advisor in Western Canada who had this situation where the client didn't want to buy permanent insurance, they wanted to buy term insurance and maybe invest the difference. And my job was to then find compelling reasons to convince the client not to do that. And the idea was I was supposed to refute every single point that this other website had, and that just didn't seem like a good way of doing it. And so I thought, because I know that if you mention Warren Buffett, people read it. But if you think about it, Warren Buffett believes in things that last. So do you think he would buy term insurance, which is designed to not continue? Or do you think he'd invest in something which costs more because it's worth more? And that particular post, which I wrote in 2007, is still read every day. There are hundreds of people each month that are still reading that. I don't really care what people read. Google likes the fact that my stuff is getting read, and that helps with other stuff. So you'll never really know, but you get interesting things like this. Now, why does a web presence matter? I was talking to an advisor, and this one was one of the people convinced that he couldn't do anything unless he hired people, and then he <laughs> didn't really have time to figure out who to hire and, and these things. And as a result, he lost a case. Like a big case. Like the client told him that I was thinking of dealing with you, but then I checked you out on Google and hey, I couldn't find you. I didn't like what I saw. Now, I'm not saying that this happens in every case, but is it not likely that clients are using search engines? They've got these smartphones, they can search for anything they want. And there can be consequences. We don't always know, but if you're working on cases and maybe they're not going somewhere, well, maybe the client checked you out and maybe what they saw wasn't what they wanted to see. The key is finding the right medium for your message. And this is where it'll vary for each of us. If it turns out that you like talking, then you can record your voice. You then have a podcast. You can do that all for free. If you like showing things, so maybe that's at a whiteboard or you like doing a voiceover on a PowerPoint, then you can record that and put it on YouTube. Now you have a video. If you like writing things, which is the medium that seems to work better for me, then you can blog. So in the course of a day or a week, I'm guessing that you're probably spending some time talking. You're probably spending some time showing things. You're probably spending some time writing. One of those will be more natural for you. And if you just use that, then you're able to create content. So in my case, I like writing. Once I've written something, I can read it. Now I can have a podcast. Uh, I'm still a little nervous of being in front of the camera, so I, I can't really just talk to a camera. That's something I, I plan to overcome later on this year. But maybe if that's for you, then you can do that. So whichever medium you prefer, you can create the other ones from it, if you so choose. Because so, say if you love just talking into, to the camera, which I think is the most powerful, because people can hear us and see us, then you can get a transcript, and that transcript is what? It's a blog post. You can take the audio, now you have a podcast. So whatever you've got, you can use. And what the key is, is to share the best of what you know for free. Because if the stuff that you're creating is not of value, then people will just click away. Right? So it can't just be teaser stuff, which a lot of websites have had, where, oh, if you want to know anything useful, then give me all your contact information, I'll contact you when I get around to it. That doesn't work. Like you have to give something away, and then people say, well, okay, yeah, I like the way this person is doing it. I would rather deal with them. I can see that they know what they're talking about. They are actually helping me, even though they don't know that I might become a client. And so this is really called consistent, persistent generosity in the terminology of Seth Godin. This is what happened in the course of a week, about a year ago. On Monday, I was on the STAR website. On Wednesday, I was in the Toronto Board of Trade newsletter. I got a lot of text there. On Friday, I was in the Metro commuter paper. And on Friday, I was in the print edition of the Toronto STAR. And that was all 
because I was using social media a little bit better than most people because most people don't use it much at all. I could not have paid for this kind of attention. Right now, you, the question that gets asked, well, okay, how many sales did you make as a result of that? Well, I didn't lose any sales as a result of that, but no, people don't necessarily start calling you up saying, I saw you in the paper, uh, can you sell, sell me some insurance, and when can we set up the app? But this is all stuff that you use in your marketing in conjunction with your other social media. Because then I can take these things and I can share it with my other audiences. It becomes part of my kit. So today, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but there's supposed to be an interview of me in the Canadian Business Journal for this month. And I think that would be an interesting article. I've got uh, an interesting meeting next Tuesday or Wednesday. And I think that would be a very good thing to hand out to those people because they're business people and that's a business publication. So it's a matter of how you use these things. But again, this is just a verification that whatever little messages I had were enough to help set me apart. And that's all you need. Like it's, you don't have to be the best, you just have to be a little bit better. And in many ways, being a little bit better just means being a little bit different. Right? So then someone will resonate, well, okay, I like this story, or I like that story, this person did that, that person did that. But if people can't see what sets us apart, then they have difficulty in seeing how we're different than average. And then more recently, I've been in the Globe and Mail. This was very interesting. This was last, uh, last year also. Uh, the Toronto Board of Trade has Business Excellence Awards. And just because of my social media stuff, I got nominated. There were 49 nominees in eight categories. I was the only one in financial services. Now, I lost, but at least I got my photo taken in front of a sign of Paris. Right? That doesn't happen every day. Now, that's an overview of some of the different tools that can be used. To make the session really valuable, uh, please ask questions, and then we as a group will do our best to see how we can help answer them. Again, there's nothing to sell, so you can ask whatever you want, and there won't be a bill at the end of the day. Who would like to ask to start? Yes? I just want to make a comment. Uh, I did a quick tip on YouTube in regards to mortgage insurance versus life insurance. And you're right, I mean, Toronto started contacting me, and then they end up getting uh, uh, their blog. But you never know who's going to see it. It's, it's great, great. That's sort of a good example of how this can work. Yes? How do you grab the analytics? What's the button you push to get there? In LinkedIn? Sure. Okay. In LinkedIn, on the right-hand side of the page, it'll show how many people have looked at your profile in some period of time. Sometimes it's over the last day, three days, five days, seven days, whatever it is. And the, where it says how many people have looked at it, that'll be in blue. The other one will be in black. So just click on the blue one, and it'll open up a page, and it'll show you the names of some of the people. Now, with the free account, sometimes it'll just say an anonymous person, whatever. With the paid account, it'll show you more. But on the right-hand side of that page, it'll have a little graph, and it'll show you either how many people looked at your profile within the 90 days, and it's a running total, or how many people, how many times you showed up in a search, and you just click on the two, and uh, that'll give you a good sense. So what I look for is I want, I actually did something contrarian. I found that there were too many people looking at my profile that weren't really relevant to me. So in the beginning, it's, it's nice to think, well, people are looking at me, but yeah, they're in the wrong country, or like, I don't really want those people looking at me. And so what I did is I actually decontented my profile. So I took out some of the stuff, because I had references to social media, et cetera. And I, but I didn't really want to be known for that, because that was just stuff I was using. It was interesting at the time. So I made the, the profile more tailored. And so that has actually reduced the number of times I show up in search. Well, okay. It, it's, it, it's provided a better quality of people who end up finding me. And as part of that, what I've also started doing is <clears throat> unlinking from people that I don't want to be associated with anymore. Because in the beginning, I would be connected to almost anyone. I wasn't being selective. It just seemed, wow, someone wants to connect to me. And I realized that wasn't strategic because what happens, because there are people who will engage in bad behavior. So they will, in essence, contact people that they don't know, that you happen to know in common, and essentially imply that you have endorsed them. 
and then they'll get connected. And so there's some things like that to be wary of, but you can get the analytics and see if they're working the way that you want. Yes, other questions? Yes? I noticed you didn't talk about Facebook or Facebook for Business. Was there a reason for that? Well, yes. <laughs> you weren't supposed to notice. Uh, as an actuary, I don't have any friends. And <laughs> Facebook wouldn't be of any use to me. No, the way I look at it, and I know that there are people who claim to be able to use Facebook for all sorts of things, but I feel that I have a business life and I have a personal life. And I might, well, we're connected on LinkedIn, and I'm on Facebook, and you might be too. I wouldn't feel as comfortable connecting to you on Facebook, because to me that's a different kind of connection. And I deal mainly in the business world, so I focus on LinkedIn as my tool. If you're dealing with, you basically want to see where the people you want to connect with happen to be. If you're dealing with a lot of consumers, for instance, then maybe Facebook is the place for you. But I have not been able to figure out a sensible way to use Facebook. I've gone to a number of presentations, and usually the things they say make no sense. So they'll give examples of, well, Starbucks and Coca-Cola are on Facebook, and they have 10 or 20 million followers, and the Gap has a store. You can just buy things online right there. Well, that's not the kind of business we're in. And I just want to be known by key people in a specific geographic area. You may find that Facebook is a really good tool for you, depending on your demographics. I just, just couldn't figure out how to make it work. Also, we have limited time. And the thing that I spend about 9% of my social media time on would be LinkedIn, because that happens to be where the people I'm interested in happen to be. Yes? Uh, I would say that I'm a LinkedIn idiot as far as uh, how to use it. Is there any service or anybody that can help you write a reasonable profile in this area and so forth? That's a challenge because I, over the years I've tried to find people who, who I could refer, saying that, okay, if I need help in this area, then, because uh, I, I, that's not something I'm able to do, well, go to this person. And it's it's very difficult to find people, because when you investigate them, then you see that maybe they've been using social media or LinkedIn for less time than you have. So I'm not really sure what to suggest, but if you know someone who is reasonably good at writing, then that's one way, or if you look at other profiles of people you're connected to and there's stuff you like there, then that's okay. I don't think it's really that difficult, because the bulk of it is really just a resume. And so that's you saying that from this date to that date, this is what I did. And the part that's a little tougher is the summary section that you can put at the, at the top, where you want to essentially give your elevator pitch or something. And so you probably know people who could maybe help you in that, but I, I'm afraid I don't have a list of, because I wanted to have something like that, saying like, here are three or five people that I would recommend, and I, I haven't been able to find that, I'm sorry. Yes? Um, any comments as it uh, relates to timing of posts? Yes, it seems to matter. Uh, did you want more detail? <laughs> Your experience in uh, the last six years, five years. Well, I tend to look at this may not, okay, this is what I happen to figure out. And I haven't really tried different ways to see if this is optimal or not. But for my marketing blog, I have posts on Tuesdays. And they'll generally be posted towards the end of the day, so like 4 or 5 p.m. And so when they're sent out by Google, they go out on the following Wednesday, because there's a feed burner service that'll email it to people. For my other blog, which is more consumer-oriented, there I put the content out on Saturdays. I figure that people will have more time to read it then. With Twitter, what I've started using, because the other thing is that you, want to, you don't want to create a perception that all you're doing all day is playing around with these tools, because then that doesn't make it look like you're doing any work. And so I'll generally be using Twitter, say, at the end of the day, like after work, or I might use it early in the morning, uh, but generally not during the day. 
But apparently, there are times during the day where people are more likely to look at these things. But those aren't the times that I'm using those tools, because I'm actually working. There are tools, one is called Buffer App, uh, another one is called Grab Inbox, where you, in essence, say that this is something that I would like to have go out on Twitter. Or you can decide whether it goes out on Twitter, or Facebook, LinkedIn. So you decide what these things are, and that application will decide for you when the best time is for those things to go out. Now, I don't know the algorithms they use, but what I like about it is that they will do it for you. And I've got mine set up. I'm using the, at least my pants stayed up. Uh, the, one, the tool I'm using is called Grab Inbox, and that's a free one. And what I've done with that is I've said, I don't want any updates going out essentially during business hours. So I'm okay with an update going out, say, before 9 a.m., maybe between noon and 1, maybe after 4, but I don't want them in the other times because I think that would create the wrong message for what I'm trying to do. Other questions? Yes? How much time do you think you spend on a weekly or monthly basis just uh, using and maintaining the various social media tools? Well, the thing that takes the most time is is the blogging, because there I'm creating original content. I have no training in writing, so maybe there are better ways of doing this stuff, but I don't really know. But the way I look at it, because some people will look at social media and be worried about the, the ROI. The way I look at it is that part of my life is to donate, and I have this issue with donating money because I always worry about how it'll get used. And when it comes to donating money, someone like uh, Warren Buffett or Bill Gates can donate a little bit more than I would be capable of donating. But I figure that we each have the same number of hours in the week. So I tend to look at what I'm doing online as me donating my time in terms of writing the blogs. So each blog post probably takes me about three hours. So that's about six hours. But you don't necessarily need to do that. But to me, that is me just trying to help the world be better in my own little way. The other stuff, the, the Twitter and LinkedIn, etc. That probably takes about one to two hours a week. What I do, because it's very easy to get immersed in these things, is I set a timer. Like, it just counts down from 15 minutes down to zero, and when it's done, I stop. Now, on certain days, I'm, I'm busy, and I maybe aren't, I'm not able to use the tools for two or three days, and so I might spend a little longer on those days. But it's not a huge commitment of time, and the key thing is really just that consistency. Because then you're being, you're reminding people of you. In essence, what you're doing is advertising, right? So these people have said, we want to receive stuff from you. And then maybe a situation will arise where they're thinking of insurance or something. And you happen to be top of mind because they keep seeing your stuff. Yes? Have you ever used any of your social media skills um, to specifically target an individual? Somebody wanted to approach maybe lawyers or doctors or dentists. Do you ever use it just to get to that one group to have? How do you do it? Okay. Uh, yes, I've done some things like that. For instance, I think accountants are good centers of influence. And starting this year, I've taken some steps to connect with more accountants. And one of the ways you do that is you figure out where accountants hide out. And on LinkedIn, there are groups for accountants. Right? So there, I forget what the names of them are. But if you join that group, then you are now in an environment of accountants. And there are groups for lawyers, so I haven't really tried lawyer groups. Uh, but when you're in that group, and you start to get to know some of the people, and then maybe there's someone that you want to. The, the thing I find very effective is that LinkedIn will show you people that maybe you know. And generally, I don't have a clue who these people are. But I treat that as a warm introduction. That LinkedIn, if you want to interpret it differently, is saying that maybe you and you should know one another. And so I'll look up that person, and some of them happen to be accountants. Once you start getting more accountants, then you get more and more, because LinkedIn then figures out that you like talking to accountants or, or whatever. Uh, or they have connections with other accountants. So LinkedIn will say that, OK, uh, maybe you should know this person. I check them out and I say, well, wow, that's someone that I would like to know. 
then I see what's common between us. And generally, it's because we have some connections, but it could also be because we're in the same group. And then I'll send that person an invitation saying that LinkedIn says that we know one another. I don't think we do, but I looked, checked out your profile. It's something personal, etc. And if you'd like to connect here, we can. And I find that in over 90% of the cases, the people will say yes. Now, when someone is connected, you can see what groups they're in. And you can say, well, oh, here's this group from called such and such that you'd never heard of, and then maybe you join that group. And so then when you try and connect with the next person, maybe now you have two groups in common. So it's a matter of just looking and seeing where they might be, and then just getting, as, to getting to be part of that environment, and then reaching out. I found that works reasonably well. Yes? Uh, you were mentioning um, electronic um, newsletters and mail newsletters. Um, do you use an, on you must use an online platform to, to do that, or do you have a sort of software for it? Yeah, I like doing things that are online, so I'm using, I mean, there are a lot of different choices. If I were starting today, I'd probably use MailChimp because they're free for, I think it's up to 2,000 subscribers, which is a ridiculously high number. Uh, but there are other ones that provide, but with something like that, there isn't a lot of support that you get. So if you're not really sure how to do things, then maybe that's not the best choice. Uh, constant contact is a lot more expensive, but I'm told from their presentations that they provide lots of support. And they also do lots of seminars in this part of the province. Uh, so the cost ends up not being that much of an issue. It really becomes a question of how much help you might need. And the really great thing is that you do get the analytics. With the other tools, you don't necessarily know who is reading your stuff, for instance. You just know that this is popular, that's not. But with the newsletter, say for instance, you had, and I wouldn't suggest you do this, but say you had an article about critical illness. You could see which actual people have looked at that. Right? And so if there's a client, and that client looked at critical illness, like don't call them up the next minute saying, hey, I saw that you're just uh, reading this article on critical illness, because they don't really know that, you're look that you have that. They may not know you have those kinds of analytics. But then maybe the next time you're talking to them, that's something that, that comes up. Right? Because they raised their hand, and they did express some interest in that. Well, but it gives you a good sense of what people like. But I'm using a, a web-based uh, system. Do you have yes. any issues with companies that you're dealing with about compliance? Well, compliance is one of those areas where you need to see what you're allowed to do. Yes. And the sense I have is that if you're in an IROC firm, there are very extreme limitations on what you can do. And if you're in MFDA, there's other restrictions. It's a fairly gray area. Uh, so I think you need to like check before you do things. I checked with a couple of lawyers before I started the blogging because I was working for an insurance company at the time. So I wanted to see that, like, is it okay if I do this? And basically the message I got was that if you're doing things on your own personal time and it's not really, you're not claiming to do it on behalf of the organization, that would be okay. But you would need to see in your case what you're doing. Huge. And so it's a huge, huge issue. Huge, huge issue. Yeah. So huge. that's something you have to be aware of. So it would take you know, you might spend six hours, I just have to spend 15 because by the time I got referrals and, and acceptance back from the dealer that I'm dealing with, it would be a week at least. Yeah, yeah. so that's... So, you know, it, it, it is an issue. But that creates that dichotomy that there are people who don't have the same restrictions and they're not using the tools when they can, whereas the people in your situation have these restrictions that are preventing you. Yeah. Yes? There may be things like that that can be done. The problem that arises is if someone is doing a search, say because the article would have a particular title, 
And so suppose someone is just looking up that title because they want to share it or something. And they see that that same article shows up on multiple advisor sites or other places, then that may not, that may not set the right message. But I think if you're using content that has already been created by whoever, I tend to avoid things from insurance companies. I just don't find that it's written in a way that I think is the way I'd like to have communications. But I find things like newspapers are very good. So if you've got things from, say, the Globe and Mail or the Wall Street Journal or magazines, those are pretty credible. And maybe if you're allowed, then you can send links to those particular articles. But again, you need to see what you're permitted to do in your environment. Other questions? Yes? Going forward, what do you have to use in the future? Well, I'm comfortable with the tools I am using. There are always new things that come about. There's this thing called, I don't even know how to say it, but it's interest with the P, so Pinterest. And that's supposed to be really popular these days. I am on it. I can't quite figure out what use it is to me. It just seems to be pictures. But, so I don't think I would explore that much. Google Plus is another option that's backed by Google. It doesn't seem to be getting a lot of traction. But I figure that anything that I do that makes Google happy can only be good for me. So if I'm reading something and I want to share a link to it, then I won't do a Facebook like, I won't do a tweet, I will do a Google plus one. Because I figure that that is helping Google like me more because I'm helping them. It could be that it makes no difference, but I haven't quite figured out a strategy. Something that I think will have more effect is using pictures. And because it just seems that with mobile devices that are people like pictures. So whenever I have a blog post, I always have a picture. And sometimes those are things that draw people in. I don't know. But I find that I want to be on the mainstream platforms. And for me, LinkedIn is really the key. And then Twitter, I also use for some traffic. And then the blogging is just me sharing stuff. But I don't have a next big thing that I'm ready to jump from. But if I needed to, I don't think it would be that difficult to make the transition. That's the other thing, is that people get concerned about, am I using the right platform? Whatever you're doing, you're learning skills so that whatever comes next, you'll be more able to adapt to. Like, I, I never used MySpace, and it looks like it's, it's on the decline, all right? So I, I was lucky I didn't waste any time learning something that, that is not popular anymore. But if I had used it, then I could have transitioned from that to something else, because I would have learned some skills at that time. Other questions? We're not getting a lot from this side of the room. This is the red side over here. Oh, OK, that's good. At least I'm not getting any heckling, so that's a good sign. OK, so are there any other questions? We'll maybe take one more. Yes? Is it harmful in LinkedIn to have non-business or non peak I get invitations to connect from people that really aren't core to my business. It might be a past work colleague. Should I accept those, or how do you politely say no? Or does it matter? Well, if you don't want to connect to someone, you really don't need to say anything. You can just ignore them, and nothing will happen. I didn't really know much about networking, because I didn't really start networking until like three or four years ago. So it's all new to me. So I had to study how networking works, the theories, and those kinds of things. The way I understand it, networking isn't about the people you're connected to directly. It's the people they know. And we don't know who they happen to know. And my general approach is that if I'm OK connecting with quote unquote good people, because I don't know where, I don't think anything bad will happen. And maybe there'll be something good that happens as a result of that. But you'd need to figure out your own strategy. But it's very difficult, because there's serendipity, right? You don't know what will lead to what. So it's very difficult to say that I am doing this because I'm expecting that. I just find that if I'm doing good things, then good things seem to happen. And because through whatever I've happened to learn about social media, when I connect to someone, I can usually make some suggestions to them on how they might improve their LinkedIn profile. So I'm trying to become a resource to them instantly. So I'm on their side of the table. 
And given that insurance is the same price no matter where you buy it, then if a situation arises, well, okay, well, here's someone who actually helped me be more successful in my own business. Maybe I would uh, think of them. So from that point of view, I don't think you can lose. Uh, but you really need to see. I used to connect to advisors, but now, uh, like, so please don't send me invitations because I'm actually trying to reduce the number of advice I'm connected to. But that was strategic in the past because until the end of last year, I used to do some split case work. So I wanted to be known by advisors, but now I no longer do that. And so I don't really have that same need. This year, I'm focusing more on accountants and lawyers as centers of influence. So you can have that strategic element, but you never know. Someone took the time to reach out to you if it's not just a generic invitation and they look like a decent person, then maybe that, that would be good. Like, I was talking to Darren earlier about someone that we know in common uh, that I just met as a stranger through LinkedIn. And he's ended up being a very good center of influence. Again, LinkedIn says, you may know this person. I didn't, but we meet every couple of months. And I met my lawyer that way, too. So it's, there's no way of telling where these things will end. So I just find that just having good intentions seems to work pretty well. And then if I see that there's misbehavior, like say, if they, all they do is keep sending self-promotional stuff, well, I don't really need that. Or if they're doing other things I don't like, then maybe I'll unlink from them later on. Okay, so that was the last question. I will stay around a little bit longer if people have more questions. I hope this session has been of some value, and my intention is to post it on YouTube so that you can watch it 50 more times. <laughs>